All right. Good to see you this morning. God bless you for being here again. And man, what a great opportunity to be with Rick and have him lead us in worship like that. How many of you know what PTL means? Praise the Lord, right? And how many of you know what PTLA means? Praise the Lord anyway, right? Have you ever had any praise the Lord anyway situations? You know, those things you can't help, can't change. I got a call. I'm supposed to leave out uh, as soon as I finish preaching. Uh, so I'm going to be preaching in, re- you know, really quick to the day. So I need you to listen quick because I got to catch a flight. And uh, so <clears throat> I get a call last night and I'm flying back to Austin, right? This is New Mexico. I'm going back to Texas. So I had a layover in Dallas and then I'm going to Austin. So I got a call last night from the airlines We're so sorry, a recording by the way, we're so sorry we've canceled your flight, but we've put you on a different flight. Your new layover will be Los Angeles to Austin. So you know what you say? P-T-L-A, P-T-L-A, praise the Lord. Anyway, some things you can't help. But I still got to preach fast, so I got to get you to listen fast, okay? All right. Well, thank you for being here. And over the last few nights, I've had a great time. I love the city of Albuquerque. I love New Mexico. And uh, several years ago, my wife and I were going to come out to Glorietta. I don't know if I should even tell you this story. It might make you mad, but I I, I think you'll appreciate it. I'm getting ready to go to Glorietta. I was preaching at uh, Music Week. And uh, I told my wife, I said, honey, why don't we drive out to Glorietta? And she said, Why? And I said, well, you know, uh, the scenery. And she said, okay. So we took off, and I'd really never driven from Austin to New Mexico. And about eight hours in, she goes, well, where's the scenery? I said, well, look around. I mean, (laughs) you can see as far as the eye can see. And uh, I had my, I said, well, we can listen to the radio or something. And I just, I had my radio on scan for like eight hours. And it was just rolling through, you know. But I love it. I mean, I really love it out here. So I appreciate very much the opportunity to be here. Have you ever wanted in life, and I think I know the answer to this, but let me go ahead and ask. Have you ever wanted in life at any point to have the opportunity to start over again? I think everybody would like some opportunities to take a mulligan on a few things in life, to start over again. It isn't always easy to start over again, is it? Uh, I heard Greg Laurie, the California pastor, preaching one time. He told a story about a man who woke up one morning, looked in the newspaper, and they had printed his obituary in the newspaper. And uh, he was furious. I mean, not because of what they said, but because he, had his, he was reading his own obituary in the newspaper. And uh, man, he was outraged and he stormed down to the newspaper office, stormed into the editor's office. He said, man, I demand an apology and and you got to retract this. This has ruined me. It's humiliated me. It's going to cost me money. And the guy's like, I'm sorry, man. We're really, really sorry. We didn't mean to do it. He goes, sorry is not enough. This is going to cost me money. You have really put me in a bad way. I'm a businessman, respected man in this community. Finally, the editor said, look, sir, we are very sorry. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Today I'm going to take you out of the obituaries and put you in the birth announcements and you can just start all (laughs) over again. Well, wouldn't it be nice if it was that easy to start over again in life? It's not always that easy. But in the Christian life, how many of you know that there are seasons in our lives as Christians when we really need to start over again with God? Let me just ask, let me, let me just ask, this is not a youth conference, so let me just ask, how many have been walking with God 20 years? Raise your hand. Keep them up as long as you can. How many have been walking with God 30 years? Keep your hands up. How many have been walking with God 40 years? Keep your hands up. You've been saved at least 50 years? Keep your hands up. In all that time of a half a century or a quarter of a century, I've been walking with God almost 40 years myself. Has there ever been a time when you needed to start over with God? God was gracious to me in 1976 and allowed me to start over. I had been saved at the age of 14. And then within a short time, nobody to blame but myself, I began to really just subtly and slowly 
begin to drift away and then more openly rebel. But God was gracious to me at the age of 19. I was able to start over again with the Lord as the person I am today. But I got to be totally transparent with you today. Over the last nearly 40 years, there have been many opportunities when I've needed to start over with God. And I'm just thankful today that I serve a God who allows us to begin again. What we need in the Christian life are, are seasons and opportunities, moments when we can begin again. We need an old-fashioned word called revival. We need it in our personal lives. We need it in our churches. I believe that God is going to send revival to America. I cannot guarantee when it's going to happen, but I can guarantee what it's going to look like when it does. So this morning, I want us to open our Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, as we look together at the subject, the revival God promises. And uh, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Uh, it's kind of a new translation, but it's really uh, a little more literal than the New, New International Version. But it's a good read, and I've really been preaching out of it for about a year. I really like it. <clears throat> but you can follow along with pretty much anything you have. Now, this is God speaking to King Solomon when the temple was dedicated for the first time. The first temple, which was, you may remember, the most glorious temple. It was the greatest of all the temples. And it may have been, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you know this, some reputable archaeologists and scholars believe that the Temple of Solomon may have been the largest building in the world at the time of its construction. It was ornate. Solomon spared no expense, and it was the most beautiful building that anyone had ever seen. And can you imagine 3,000 years ago when most people lived in mud huts and rock huts and, 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 uh, and, and their lives were nothing but tough, and yet their place of worship was the most ornate and glorious and most beautiful building in the entire world. And they spent about two weeks dedicating that place and tens of thousands of sacrifices and celebration. And at the end of the celebration of the dedication of that temple, God spoke to Solomon. And he said something a little bit unusual in verse 13. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command the locust to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Dr. O.S. Hawkins, in his great book on revival from 20 years ago or so, said this, and I quote, after 2,000 years of ministry, what the church urgently needs is revival, to live again. Now, they're at the dedication of the temple. And how many of you have ever been on one of those mountaintop experiences with God? It could be, I would hope that it would be this week, one of those experiences. But you've been in a revival, or you've been maybe at a wedding of a family member, or a graduation of a child or a grandchild, and you're just, man, you're just exhilarated. I mean, you're pumped. You're feeling like, this is it. It's hard to imagine when you're at one of those high water marks in life, one of those apex moments. When you're at the summit of your spiritual life, it's really hard to imagine a time when you might be far from God. And the people in Solomon's day were at, they were on a spiritual high. They could not imagine a time 
Solomon could not imagine a time when they would ever rebel and fall away from God. But God knew there would come a time like that. God knew that there would come a day when the people would begin to drift away and fall away. And God said, when that day comes, here's what's going to happen. I'll shut up the heavens. There's going to be judgment. How many of you know you cannot rebel against God and experience all his blessing at the same time? That is a message that is being completely obscured in the contemporary uh, culture that somehow God is so loving, so forgiving, so merciful that there's never a bite. There's never an edge. There's never a chastisement. There's never a good old-fashioned take me to the woodshed and wear me out for my own good God. But how many of you have walked with God long enough to know that you cannot experience all of God's blessings when you're in disobedience before him? I mean, it's just truth. It's facts. Anytime we violate the covenant relationship that we have with a loved one, there is a price to pay, whether it's your children, your marriage, or God. When you violate the terms of the covenant of relationship, there's always a price to pay. God said, if my people get into sin and rebel against me and will not turn to me, he said, I'll bring some calamity. I'll bring some harshness into their life in order to wake them up and bring them back to God. Do you suppose that America is experiencing any of the judgment of God today? You can think what you want. I'll think what I want, okay? I believe we are in some ways under the judgment of God right now. You say, but God loves us. That's because he loves us too much to let us continue to go the way we're going. And if we want to experience, I'll I'll get to my sermon in a minute, but I'm about to preach. If we want to experience the full measure of his blessing, we've got to be the people that he desires us to be. And I remember uh, my Bible says judgment begins in the house of God. And seeing that these things are coming to pass, what manner of people ought ye to be? And so God said there may come a day that when my people have rebelled against me and refused to come to me because I love them, I will allow some chastisement, some some whooping to come into their life. He said, I'll shut up the heavens so that there's no rain. And if you're in an agricultural society and you don't have rain, you're in a world of hurt. In fact, have you ever thought about this? If it doesn't rain in Israel, they have no crops. They can't feed their children. Not only that, they can't feed their animals. If they can't feed their animals, their sheep and their ox and all the rest begin to suffer. They begin to be uh, 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 unhealthy. And if the sheep and the oxen are unhealthy, how are you going to present an unhealthy animal on the altar of God? If you have no rain and you have no crops, how are you going to have a grain offering to offer to God? You see, if God says, I withhold rain, not only do you have bad crops and it's bad for the economy, you don't even have access back to God because you won't have good animals to lay on the altar and you won't have good grain to offer at the grain sacrifice. God said, if you rebel against me so far that I have to bring such judgment on you, there may come a day when you don't even have access back back to me in the traditional forms. And in those days, there will be a time of desperation in which there will only be one way to get back to me. God is saying here, I will cut off the sacrificial system so that just bringing religious ritual to me will not cut it. I'll need your heart in those moments. God said in that day when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people. Now they had just sacrificed. Guys, get this. They had just sacrificed tens of thousands of animals in the last two weeks. If ever there was a message to the Jewish people at that day, it was the sacrificial system is the way back to God. And then God turns around and says, if you ever slip away from me, all the sacrifices in the world won't bring you back to me. If you slip away from me, you've got to come back to me with your heart. You ever thought about that? 
He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. He didn't say a word about animal sacrifices. Whoa, glory to God. This is to you and me. This is a passage that transcends the Testaments. It's as good for you and me as it was for Solomon 3,000 years ago. What God is saying to you and me is get your heart right. Get your heart right. It's not your exterior or your external religious practice that is so concerning to the heart of God. When you are far from God, the number one thing is get your life aligned with God again. So God said there's only one way. So I want you to notice four quick things. You say, what time is your flight leaving? Four quick things. <laughs> In the revival God promises, pride steps down. Look at verse 14. If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves... You know, somebody once said, pride is the only disease in the world that makes everybody sick except the person who has it. (laughs) God said, if you want to return to me, if you want to get things right, if you want to be back on a good footing with God, humble yourself. Now that word humble is a, you know, the Hebrew language is an old language, an ancient language, and it's built on verbs and it's built on actions. Almost every Hebrew word is originally a verb. Because the most uh, archaic form of language is action words like stop, go, eat, you know. And uh, this word for humble, it's a verb, but it's a, it's a picture of, a, of taking a bird in your hands and folding the bird's wings so that the bird cannot fly. It's a way of holding a bird and encompassing, like if a person wanted to take a live dove up to the altar. Well, how do you carry a bird? You've got to contain its wings. This word for humble is the word which means to hold a bird in such a way that you fold its wings so it cannot fly. In other words, you subdue the bird so that it cannot get away. The word for humble is a word which means submit. Be like the bird whose wings are folded so that it cannot fly. This word for humble is a word that's used 36 times in the Old Testament. 18 of the times it's used in the way that we're using it today. Humble yourself. But 18 of the times it's used in the Old Testament, this Hebrew word is used to describe a military superior power overwhelming an inferior uh, military power. It's a military term. This word for humble, check this out, it describes one king with such superior firepower and such superior force that he overwhelms another king and another army. And in those days, when one king overwhelmed another, they would bring the king that lost, if they didn't kill him, they would bring him out, the, 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 the reigning king, the, 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 the winning king, would bring the losing king out into the public square in front of all of the losing king's troops and in front of all the winning king's troops, the losing king would come out and bow before the winning king and the winning king would place his shoe on the neck of the losing king to show his superiority over that kingdom. That process of putting the boot on the neck of the losing king is the Hebrew word humble. When God says, humble yourself, he's saying, get yourself low in my presence. Pride steps down. God will not and cannot bless a proud heart. Pride never pleases God. Now, my wife is a pet person. She loves animals. She loves animals. We live kind of out in the country, and and we've got deer, and i I have to come home with, you know, bags of deer corn all the time. It's legal to feed them. It's okay. And uh, my wife, every morning, she gets up and we feed the cat and uh, the dog. And I take the dog for a walk. And she goes out on the deck and feeds the deer. And she's got names for them and all that kind of stuff, you know. Me, 
Not so much. I, I, I don't need a pet. But, you know, my wife loves pets. And so guess what? <laughs> we've got some. So uh, we've been married 34 years, and I've learned a long time ago, you don't stay married 34 years by being right. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. So, uh, you know, I don't want pets. I'm, I, you know, don't judge me. I just don't want pets. Uh, but uh, she does, and so we have them, you know. One, one time she got a puppy and she said, honey, I want you to, I want to walk this dog. I want this dog to be a dog I can walk through the neighborhood. So take him out and teach him how to walk on a leash. <laughs> well, you know, I love the puppy. It's a cute puppy. I mean, I, I don't dislike animals. I just don't want them. And so I said, well, honey, what do I know about teaching a dog to walk? And she said, well, here's the leash and Google it and go teach the dog to walk. So I'm out here with this little puppy, and, it, you know, a puppy is a puppy, you know. And the puppy's like crazy. I mean, he's just running all over the place, and, and I'm just kind of embarrassed, you know, because I have no idea what to do. And, you know, I'm kind of, I don't want to just drag the puppy through the neighborhood, you know, uh, because the neighbors will think badly of me. So I'm just out there, and I'm just embarrassed with this puppy running all over the place, tangling up my feet and everything else. And all of a sudden, now check this out, all of a sudden the puppy accidentally grabbed the leash and its teeth. And then the puppy is just, I mean, he's just going on back home. And, and all of a sudden, as long as the puppy had the leash and its teeth, we were all right. He's walking in a straight line. Honest to goodness, this is how preachers think. I thought to myself, this is just like me and God. This puppy thinks he's in control just because he has the leash in his mouth and I've got the leash, but he's holding the leash in his mouth and he thinks he's in control. And I thought, you know what? God has blessed me so many times. God's got me on a leash, but sometimes I put the leash in my mouth and act like I'm in control. Brothers and sisters, can I share something with you that I've I'm imagining, I'm guessing that some of my brothers and sisters figured this out a while back. We're not in control. I had a buddy in my former church. He was kind of a big boy. I don't know exactly how to describe him, except he was a big boy. And, uh, you know, he was like triple XL. You know what I mean? And I'm not talking about muscle. I'm just talking about a big boy, you know, Georgia boy. And he had a T-shirt that said, I'm large and in charge. And can I share something with you about your spiritual life? God's got a t-shirt just like that. God is large and in charge. And what he wants from you and me, he doesn't want our advice. He doesn't want our back talk. God wants our humility and submission before him. If revival is gonna come to your life, if revival is going to come to your church, if revival is going to come in New Mexico or in Austin, Texas, or in America, then in Jesus' name, pride must step down. Amen. Then I want you to see something else real quickly. I want you to see in the revival God promises, prayer steps up. Prayer steps up. Look at verse 14. The Bible said, uh, if my people were to call by my name, humble themselves and pray. I love what Jack Taylor said about prayer. If you write anything down, I've said this week, write this down. If prayer is anything, prayer is everything. If prayer is anything, prayer is everything. I'm telling you, I've, I've looked at that every which way I can look at it, and I still think it's a good statement. If prayer is anything, prayer is everything. Because ladies and gentlemen, as Adrian Rogers once said, if prayer can do anything, God can do it, and God can do anything. Prayer gives us unlimited access to unlimited power. And look what God said. God said if revival comes, if my people are to experience a healing of their land and a fresh touch from heaven, then prayer is not an option. Prayer is a mandatory essential. God said the way back the starting over place, the, 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 the spark of revival begins when my people pray. Do you know how many times the word prayer or praying or prayers occurs in the Bible? I'll tell you. More than 500 times 
The word prayer or praying or prayed or some variation of prayer, over 500 times the word prayer occurs in the, New, in the Bible. Let me put that in perspective. I'm 58 years old. I know you thought I was probably 20, 30 years younger than that, but I'm 58 years old. And uh, sometimes I think about, you know, how much longer I'm going to pastor my church. And let's say I'm blessed to pastor my church till I'm 68. That's 500 Sundays. Right? If I preached for the next 10 years every verse of Scripture on prayer, I would still not be finished preaching on prayer if I preached on prayer every single Sunday for the next decade at Hyde Park Baptist Church. Can I ask you a question? Do you think prayer matters to God? That a preacher couldn't even preach through every verse of Scripture related to prayer if he preached on prayer every Sunday for the next 10 years? There are 12 words in the Old Testament that mean prayer, and this word is the most common of them all. And it means, it comes from a verb which means to cut. And it means, it's like, it's, it's hard to imagine it, but just stay with me. This word means that when you see the need and you just press in, you intervene, you step in between the problem and God and you become an intercessor and an intervener, you cut in and you begin to cry out and call out to God and you just say, God, help me, help me, Lord. I'm, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm far from you. Lord God, I'm calling on you now. Please hear my prayer. You know, I'm in a, a city, as I've shared in a couple of settings this week, a city that is in desperate need for revival, and the pastors of our city have covenanted together, and it's an organic thing. It's growing up from the grassroots. Nobody's really in charge of it. It's just all a bunch of us have just similar hearts. And we pray together. Our, uh, the pastors of our city, mega church pastors, church planters, small churches, uh, uh, traditional churches, contemporary churches, black churches, white churches, Asian churches, Hispanic churches, um, charismatic churches, Presbyterian churches, Baptist churches, we just pray together. We just believe that the times we live in are so desperate. That the things that we do agree on, like Jesus is Lord and the Bible is the word of God, are such big, big rocks to stand on that the other things that, we, that do separate us are not important enough for the body of Christ to be constantly you know, disenfranchised from each other while the world goes to hell. And let me tell you something, if the world goes to hell, it's going to drag your children and grandchildren down with it unless the church of Jesus Christ experiences revival. And I mean, this is life and death stuff. So somehow in the city of Austin, Texas, God has just spoken to the hearts of so many pastors that it is time to not stop believing the distinctions that we believe. Man, I'm Baptist born and Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. <laughs> but if Jesus is your Lord, you're my brother. So we pray together. And about, I don't know, we're in a huge drought, uh, like you, you know a lot of the country is. And Austin, Texas, Central Texas is in a terrible drought. And last August, the uh, city planners came out and said, we've got about 90 days left of water in this city. And I mean, that's scary stuff. They've been warning. I mean, they, we've got all kinds of watering restrictions and all that kind of stuff. But they came out. Not too long ago, and they said, look, we got about 90 days left water unless something happens. And we had a group of pastors that met at Hyde Park at 6 o'clock one morning for prayer. And uh, they were down by the altar, just pastors. And uh, guys from all over, different churches, everything. And uh, everybody was just praying. And one of the guys just stood up and said, I just feel impressed as we're praying here that the Lord wants us to gather all the churches of Austin together and pray for rain. And, and several other pastors said, you know, I'm feeling the same thing. And, and so all the pastors said, well, they said, Kai, can we use Hyde Park? Because it's a central location, it's a big building. Can we use Hyde Park? And of course. One month later, 
with nothing more than just pastors getting on the internet, the email, inviting, letting churches know. One month later, a thousand Christians showed up to Hyde Park Baptist Church. We met at seven o'clock one night. We prayed for two hours. Now we had some worship, and it was, you know, worship based prayer, but no preaching. No, I mean, preachers would get up and read some scripture and lead prayer, but no preaching, no, no grandstanding, no nothing like that, just prayer. Two hours of prayer for revival and rain, 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 rain. And we hadn't seen it rain like, I mean, it rained here and there, sprinkled a little bit, but for like years, it's been no rain. Three days later, how do I say this in Hebrew? We had a gully washer. I mean, son, it poured. We had flash floods in the city of Austin. We had people lose their lives in the flood. Now, I'm not saying God killed somebody in a flood. I'm just saying it was that big of a rainstorm. That rainstorm came three days after the city of Austin's pastors and churches got together and prayed for rain. And friend, let me tell you something. It made national news. (laughs) This is probably CNN calling me right now. (laughs) Can you believe this? Hallelujah. Anyway, they'll call me back. And so, (laughs) praise God. So, I want you to know, we haven't filled the lake up quite yet. But since that prayer meeting about seven months ago, five, six months ago, We have had two more flash floods. We have had days of rain that have just been unbelievable. And all to the glory of God, when God's people pray, listen, God moves. And God has said, and and look at this, this is so simple. God has said, if you pray, I'll hear you. What, what, What are we doing with our lives if we're not praying. Third thing, i got to hurry because, you know, they're calling all over the place. <laughs> if, re- if the revival God prom- in the revival God promises, not only does pride step down, not only does prayer step up, but I want you to look at passion steps out. Look at verse 14. If my people are called by my name, humble themselves and pray, and seek my face. Seek my face face. C.T. Studd, a preacher from another generation, once said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. God said, seek my face. You could translate it like this, you know, uh, desire my presence, because the word for seek there means to desire or to beg, to have a real hunger for something. Uh, In fact, the Hebrew verb here describes intense action. You know, sometimes I dress casually, but I rarely live casually, amen? I'm just too wired up. And You know, God is calling upon men and women of all ages to have a passion in their heart, a burning zeal in their heart for the things of God. Jesus once made a statement that is one of the most astounding statements. It's really hard to even understand it. But here's what he said. The kingdom of God suffereth violence and violent men take it by force. There's something in the heart of God that is looking for men and women with such a passion that they will never take no for an answer when it comes to what God has promised. Do you remember Jacob wrestling with the, uh, with the angel uh, of God at Peniel, which is over on the other side in what is now today modern country of Jordan? And he wrestled with the angel, remember that, all night long? And when the daylight was coming, the angel was about to leave. And, and, and the angel of God said to Jacob, let me go. And Jacob said, and he's talking to God. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to speak irreverently or encourage irreverence, but when was the last time you grabbed the horns of the altar of God and said, I will not let go until you have blessed me and fulfilled your promise in my life? You say, well, I just couldn't do that. I'm telling you, God is looking for men and women who will do nothing less. These are desperate times. God said when the hour is desperate, he needs men and women who seek his face, who desire him with everything they've got. And brothers and sisters, listen, when you seek the face of God, uh, you cannot pursue lesser things. You know, there's an old hymn we used to sing about seeking the face of God. And the things of earth will grow, say it with me, strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let me put it this way. Have you ever been getting ready to go to church or work or an appointment? Come on now. And you got everything and you're running late and you're just like, man, I got to get out the door. This happens to me. I got to get out the door. And all of a sudden you say, uh, wait a minute now, <laughs> where's my keys? And you know what you do at a time like that, right? The first thing you do when, you're, when you don't know where your keys are, honey, have you seen my keys? <laughs> but has anybody ever had that moment when, you know, you hadn't lost them, you just don't know where they are, you know? And what do you do when you are late and you can't find your keys? Do you say, well, let me check Facebook for a minute. Do you say, well, let me call a friend. Let me watch the Today program. No, no, no. You start turning over everything in your house. You start looking under stuff, and you know, bless God, there's not a chance they're under that, but you're going to look anyway because you got to find things. You start looking up on top of things you can't even reach. You'd have had to have a ladder to put over there, but you'll look, and you'll do, you'll turn over cushions. You'll open drawers and leave them open. You'll tear the whole house up. I, you'll rip stuff out. Of, I got to find my keys, and nothing else matters, and if somebody bugs you, don't bug me right now. I got to find my keys. Because when you want something that matters to you, you'll stop worrying about everything else long enough to make your focus completely and totally upon that one thing until you find it. May I just say to you, God is looking for men and women in New Mexico and in Austin, Texas, and all over this country who are willing to pursue God with a hot heart just like that. And it has never been any different, and it never will be. God is looking for men and women who will seek his face. And then one thing more, and then i got to go to L.A. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> in the revival God promises... Listen to me. Purity steps in. Look at verse 14 again. If those that are called by my name humble themselves, pride steps down, and pray, prayer steps up, seek my face, passion steps out, and turn from their wicked ways. Purity steps in. John Wesley once said, Give me a hundred men who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I care not if they be clergymen or laymen, they alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of God on earth. Brothers and sisters, when did we get the idea in the body of Christ that God was okay with a little bit of sin? We, we, we serve a holy God. God did not become less holy during the 1960s. God did not become less holy when some court decided that a man could marry a man. God did not become less holy when some court decided that you could buy marijuana at the 7-Eleven. God did not become less holy when a bunch of Christians decided that drinking on Saturday night was going to be okay. God did not become less holy during the sexual revolution when AIDS and STDs became commonplace among our population. God has never changed. And God says, if my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I'll heal their land. 
I'll forgive their sins. Things will be okay again. This word for wicked, it's a powerful word. Turn from their wicked ways. It means to repent of evil. Ladies and gentlemen, can I just get this in our perspective? I'm not making this up. The translation here is beautiful, wicked ways. But can I just give you what the word wicked in Hebrew means? It means malignant. Do you know what sin does? It devours your life. It devours your spiritual life the way cancer devours your physical body. Sin is a cancer that destroys our spiritual life and our relationship with God and our faith with God and our, and our fellowship with God. Sin destroys. And may I say something else about it while I'm in passing? This isn't real theological, but hopefully you can understand it. In my experience, personally, as well as being a pastor and observing in other people's lives, write this down. Sin makes you stupid. You know what I'm saying? Somebody gets in sin, they do the stupidest things. You know, you see a preacher, he runs off with his girlfriend. You say, what happened? I'll tell you what happened. Sin makes you stupid. You see a guy going along, he's doing okay, serving God, all of a sudden he decides to start smoking a little crack on the side. Are you kidding me? Sin makes you stupid. And when you start getting into that lifestyle, child of God, whether it's just a little bit, eventually it'll be a lot. Because sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go, keep you longer than you ever wanted to stay, and make you pay a price you never intended to pay. Because sin is like a cancer. One of my buddies that pastors one of America's great churches had a man in his church that really every spring, this man would put on a a show in his front yard with his flowers. This guy knew how to, he would win like the yard of the month and, you know, they would write him up in the newspaper and everything because his flowers were absolutely incredible. I mean, he had every kind of flower conceivable, all the colors and sizes, and he would design the boxes and everything, and his yard was incredible. My buddy was telling me about it. One day, my buddy was over at his church member's house, and he was, you know, acknowledging the flowers, and he asked him this question. He said, man, how come it is you've got such beautiful flowers? What's your secret? You know what he said? He said, well, pastor, I not only love flowers, I hate weeds. In other words, if you're going to have a good flower garden, it's not enough to plant pretty flowers. You've got to keep the weeds out. And I think you get the point spiritually. If you want to have a pure life with God, it's not enough just to feast on the good things of God. You've got to keep the sin away from your life that destroys the beauty of the things that God is doing in you. How many, of you, how many of you believe that not even worrying about somebody else, not thinking about somebody else, not worrying about your neighbor or what's going on across the, uh, the country or where, what's happening in Washington, D.C., how many of you just think that the person sitting in your chair needs to deal with God today about some weeds, about some issues? You see, I believe revival's going to come to America. I believe revival's going to come to Austin, Texas. I believe revival could come to New Mexico. I I don't know enough about it to know the spiritual condition of your state. Maybe you're in revival. I don't know. But if you're here today and you say, Pastor, uh, Brother Kai, I I think America is too far gone. I, I, I know how you feel. I sometimes get a little discouraged myself. You may think, man, I think our culture is so far gone, we're just headed for, for doom. Well, maybe. Could be. If we don't see a return to God, I I think we're doomed. I I personally think we're living in the last days. I don't know where on the scale, but I'm not an alarmist. I just read my Bible and the newspaper, and I think, man, this can't go on much longer. So maybe you say, you know what? I just don't have the faith to believe in a national awakening. I just think we're too far gone. Okay. Can you believe that your state can be revived? You say, I don't know, man. It's, you know, too many of them and not enough of us. Okay, could be. What about your church? You say, you don't know what's going on at my church. I don't think my church can see revival. Well, if you can't believe God for a national awakening and you can't believe God for a statewide revival and you can't believe God for your church to be revived, could I just ask you to do this? Would you just mentally draw a circle around the chair you're sitting in and ask God to revive everything inside that circle? 